Okay, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, and do we have any on Twitter? Okay. You can go first. And please uh, let me know who you're, which of the panel members you'd like to answer the question. Uh, first, the first question, I, I don't know uh, who can reply on it. Maybe one of the audience. I, I, I can't uh, des uh, decide who can reply to me. Uh, first question is, we are talking about innovation. When you, we are talking about innovation, we need um, a home for innovation. Who can uh, make this rule? Uh, who can ma make a, a container for all ideas? that uh, every person in every person have uh, i am talking about that uh, maybe the, uh, everyone in qatar in uh, in this region and more maybe in more than this region have a small idea uh, and this small idea he, he he don't know how to uh, to communicate this idea to others okay uh, by communicating his idea with another ideas for other persons they make developing for a specific idea. Uh, these all ideas should be contained in a specific container. This container should uh, have a fund, uh, should have uh, services provided, uh, a lot of services needed for this innovation and containing all of these ideas. Okay, um, let me, I, I, I'm describing that because uh, I, I was working on open source applications. Sometimes I want to make an open source product and make it uh, for uh, public, for public, for all. But actually I was afraid that someone stole my idea and make it commercial and get money from it. Okay? Uh, I, don't know, uh, I don't know what is the correct way that I, I'm going in okay, to have my rights of my ideas Okay, and uh, uh, have a respect from all others that this is my idea. Okay, I will not going to share my idea if I, I, I don't get a, a benefit from it. So I'm going to ask Habib to respond first and then Dr. Sheikha to respond second. Uh, Habib from the perspective of the entrepreneur and Dr. Sheikha from the perspective of how do you encourage this inside a company. Yeah, so I th you're talking about ideas. Ideas are useless on their own. It's all about execution. So if I were you, I would not worry about someone stealing my idea or someone trying to, you know, you know, work something against me. I would be, I would be open. Maybe not open with all the world, but open with enough people that can help you get that to the next level. You were talking about how can you get it incubated and contained, and I think this goes against everything that we talk about innovation, about openness. I think what you, th you should think about is try to, if you really want to do it, and I have an idea, I want to take it to the next level, do it. You know, do your thing. Give, get a prototype ready. It's so cheap. I think all the, the goal of this conference is to say that today the cost of innovating is cheap, and you don't have to look for funds to begin with, do something. You don't have to look for support or government support. It's all about you. It's all in your hand. You can do it, and then when you get to the next level, it's when you go and seek you know, institutional support. Uh, yes, I mean, I understand from where concern, your concern, uh, I mean, are coming. Uh, basically, currently, we don't have the right infrastructure to cultivate innovation. And part of it, because we don't have a mature IP laws. And I thought this is the purpose of, of, of I mean, uh, the outcome of uh, this gathering might, I mean, lead us into, into the next step. And I think ICT Qatar are having a brilliant incubation program through which you and, uh, I mean, uh, and others uh, uh, can, uh, I mean, develop their ideas uh, through them. And I hope that in the we can do something in this regard also. Thank you. Do you have another question? Yes, please. Hello. I have a question for Habib. You mentioned a lot about Yamli, but you didn't really talk about what Yalla Startup is, and I was just curious to know. Uh, yeah, so Yalla Startup is, from the word is come Yalla Startup, which actually tells, it's a message for entrepreneurs to say, you know, get off your ass and start up and, and just do it. And I think the, the idea came to me about a year ago, which is not really a, a brilliant idea, but basically I found a gap. I found there's a misconnect, a disconnect between the entrepreneurs having the idea to taking it to actually doing it to getting to the to angel investors. And I think what we try to focus on in, in Yellow Startup are, are three main things. A, the social stigma. You know, it's, it's, it's hard, it's, it's, 
uh, the family and friend support, we don't find that very often in the Middle East in terms of you wanting to go and leave and become your own entrepreneur. And there's a great saying that says, behind every great man, there's a great, there's a great woman. In the Middle East, I say, there's, behind every great Arab entrepreneur, there's a great mom who thinks her son or daughter is crazy to leave his job to, to, go, to go be an entrepreneur. So you know, that summarizes kind of the social stigma. So we work on that. We also work on helping entrepreneurs form their ideas and use the right tools like open source and, and Creative Commons and all of those tools that to, to basically get to the next level. Uh, and for example, in Beirut, we are doing something in November 12 to 14 called Startup Weekend where we're getting people from all over the Arab world to go there, developers and, and designers and enthusiasts to go there from long weekend. On Friday, they come in, they come up with an idea, team up and deliver on Sunday. It's a very accelerated program just in one weekend, but this is the kind of stuff that we try to do in Yellow Startup, basically the down and dirty approach of helping the entrepreneur from, from point, from idea to, to basically uh, reality. Do you have more questions? Just talk into it, it'll get going. Hello. Uh, hi. Um, I actually do have a question when it comes to innovation and when it comes to um, censorship, actually. Um, the Madame from Quito can answer that or anyone can actually talk about that a little bit. Um, if we do want to innovate, if we do want to actually think about it, if we do want to create and if we do want to be open, how can we open when there is censorship and when there's um, actually filters on data? So for yeah. the people that are listening on the web, the question is that, is that if there are filters on the information that's available and censorship on the information that's available, it becomes difficult to innovate if you can't access the fundamental information for innovation. So um, Dr. Sheikha, please. Yeah, I mean, for open innovation, I mean, information should be available and should be accessible uh, whenever is needed. But I'm not sure about what uh, type of information is censored. If it is have to do with, uh, I mean, something ethical, or I mean, uh, uh, this uh, this is not uh, not uh, within I mean the context. But uh, when we talk about uh, information, that uh, that information that helps to cultivate and foster innovation and collaborative thinking. And, and just to you know, from from the perspective of, of open access, the idea of open access is to create an abundance of information, but typically the solution is to create filters. And so the question is whether those filters themselves are open and understandable. But I mean, I don't know if that sits in, this, in the context of this panel as much as it sits perhaps in the government information panel that's coming next. So you may want to revisit that question in, in the next panel. Do you have more questions? We've got one there in the, in the back. And we'll take this one as the last question. OK. Hello. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Lucio. Uh, there was a mention that our ability to uh, generate data is more than the ability to store it as of now. Uh, is there a possibility that we might overwrite our existing data and then what happens to the companies which, which are the storage companies which say your data will be stored with us forever and ever? What happens then if at all we run out of the ability to store data? Do we overwrite the existing data in that case? Well, <clears throat> well, you know, we, we were talking about the capability to do things from technology standpoint. From legal standpoint, it is completely a different argument, which we are not involving on it, you know. And uh, as other people said before, you know, one thing is the technology, and the technology is there. Unfortunately, you know, all the regulation and things comes, comes later. You know, when we, we talk about the progress, the progress, you know, is very much made several times by people that do things, and then the regulations comes after. You know, there is always a way to protect your data, to make sure that your data are yours, no matter where they are stored and the way you store it. As the example I gave before of the services, we are going to provide to a new European country. The data will be stored in Qatar, and the server will be in Qatar. They will act on the applications that are here as a software, as a services, but they don't care because that's the way all the system is designed. I don't know if this answers your question. So I'm just going to you know, give a couple of comments to wrap up and then we'll thank the panel and we can all go have lunch. Um, but the, the first thing that sort of came out that I heard was, is it, and we've heard this all day, is really that open systems are almost unreasonably effective. 
when compared to closed systems if given enough time and enough people. And so we've heard about that in software, and I think that's what, what Hisham was talking about in terms of Red Hat, is that given enough time, even these open systems can outcompete the closed systems. And that was the case in the internet, and that was the case in the web. Even if these systems start out uh, as small as something like Linux, or as small as something like the first web page or the earliest internet servers. Um, a second theme I heard from actually three of the panelists was the importance of education. So it's important to think about education and to put these same open systems into place in the education context. Um, as you train people to be open, do that training itself in an open way. It's one of the reasons why we work on open educational resources so much at Creative Commons is that we have to actually have open educational systems if we're going to have these sorts of open innovation systems emerge. And then the third and the point that I sort of wanted to leave on is, is Habib's idea that innovation is a human right. And so if we believe that innovation is a human right, um, there's only a few places we can start. It's very difficult for me to point at Habib and tell him to innovate. Right? If we could do it, um, that's what all governments would do. But some of the, one of the things we can do is invest in the capacity of that individual to innovate. Because if enough people have the capacity to innovate and enough people have the opportunity to try to innovate, again, over time, that open system is going to be unreasonably effective. And we can start by doing that by being open. We can start by using infrastructure like Creative Commons and like Mozilla to be a part of that. So with that, I'm going to stop, turn it over to Brian, and thanks again to our panel.